It's Central Time. I'm Judith Sears Poisson, in for Rob Ferret. You're with us on the Ideas Network. Coming up, we look at what Wisconsin will do with a new $10 million federal grant to improve early childhood education and care. First, is this what wine talk sounds like to you? Don't be shy. Really get your nose right in there, really. A little citrus. Maybe some strawberry. Mm. Passion fruit. Mm. And, oh, there's just like the faintest sous-sol of like uh, asparagus. And there's a just a flutter of like a, like a nutty Edom cheese. Wow. That is from the movie Sideways. Our next guest wants to make wine accessible to everyone and to take some of that elitism out of enjoying it. Elizabeth Schneider is a certified sommelier, certified specialist of wine, and the creator of the podcast Wine for Normal People. Her new book is titled Wine for Normal People, a guide for real people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. Elizabeth, welcome to Central Time. Thank you so much for having me. I have to ask, how many times have you tasted a soupçon of asparagus in your wine? Um, never. <laughs> I'm not even sure that I've even had that in food, and I eat a lot of asparagus. I don't even know what that is. There you go. Well, is it a fair assessment to say that wine talk can sound like a foreign language? Yeah, and here's the thing about it. Some of it is a foreign language. So <laughs> some of it is, I, I remember when I first got into wine, I first had a career in technology. So I realized that sometimes when you get into things, there's a lexicon, you got to kind of get into things. But this was beyond that. This was this was things that were regular English, but when you put them all together, it didn't make any sense. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like, I know every individual word, but together they mean nothing to me. Yeah. <laughs> and no one explains it because wine, like I think other things in this world, it's like walking into a dark movie theater. You want to ask what's going on, but nobody's going to explain it to you because if you start whispering, they'll be like, shh, be quiet. Don't you know what's going on? And that's, I feel like that's what wine is about in large part. It really is not very friendly. Well, it does seem that there may be some people, not all in the wine world, who would really like to maintain that sense of elitism, that it's kind of a club you're either in or you're not. Oh, it's completely like that. And if you look at the certification bodies, it is very clearly a club they do not want most people. And even in the industry, they don't want you in there because at the highest levels, the pass rates for what is deemed a professional certification is three to five or seven percent. That's not a professional certification. That's a club. So, in fact, they are looking to get people into a club. One of the things I really like about how you talk about wine and expanding the ways that we can appreciate it is an analogy that you made. You said that when we start learning a foreign language, we would never expect to be fluent immediately. What does that mean to you in in terms of getting to know wine? Well, I think it's actually less frustrating in terms of wine because what the thing about the foreign language is like you want to talk to people and you're sitting there and you just feel horrible. Now, wine has some of that, but we do experience it with our senses. So if we can get a little bit comfortable and confident and try to kind of, you know, slowly ease ourselves in, then we can really enjoy all of it. But these proclamations that you can take one class and become an expert or read one book and become an expert. It's just not true. You have to drink it. You've got to experience it. And you really have to be curious about it. That's the other thing. Like, I think intellectual curiosity is so important in wine. And there's so many ways to get into it, too. So if you like food, you can get into it that way. If you like history, there's so much history. There's lots of history in the book, but there's lots of stuff that you can you can say, well, you know, that that period of time really interests me. As long as it's after the Romans, pretty much you're <laughs> in good shape. You know, they spread they spread wine and viticulture all throughout the Western world. But art history and uh, culture, I mean, so many different ways you can approach it. Geology, weather, everything. So there's so many di different elements. If there's something that you're interested in, I bet that I could find a way for you to <laughs> relate that to wine. 
We're talking with Elizabeth Schneider right now. She's a certified sommelier, a certified specialist of wine, and her new book is titled Wine for Normal People, a guide for real people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. You can join in at 800-642-1234. And Elizabeth, we talked about it being a little bit like learning a foreign language. So let's go with one of the basics of learning a foreign language, basic vocabulary. How are wine varieties named? What does that mean if it's a Cabernet versus, say, a Gewürztraminer? Well, this is a a really important thing. So it's just all it is, is a species or a type of grape. So European grapevines are called Vitis vinifera. That's the kind of kind of species. So the genus is Vitis and it's vinifera. We don't have that in the United States. That's not something that's native. Those are the European native grapevines. So Cabernet Sauvignon or Chardonnay is just the type of grape. Now, this this is the really important thing and the thing that drove me crazy when I first got into wine. Some places, namely France, some of Italy, name their stuff by place. So the grape won't be apparent, but once you see what's there, it's all grapes that you know. So if I tell you that I'm giving you a Sancerre, you have to just realize that that's just Sauvignon Blanc. It's not, it, but, but in Europe, especially in some of the older places, they name stuff by place because the place was more important actually than the grape. So all of these grapes have been transported over to the U.S. and Australia and to what we call the New World, which is everywhere but Europe. And as they moved, they decided to take the grape name because you can't really take the place with you, obviously. (laughs) Good point. Good point. Well, for as funny as it might sound to the uninitiated, all those different ways of describing what we might pick up on when looking at, smelling and tasting wine does serve a purpose. um, and, And it can actually help us zero in on what we do and don't enjoy. So let's start with what you call the basics of tasting talk. And the first point is to see. So we're looking at the wine. What are we looking for? Here's the real crazy thing about seeing or looking at wine. It's the least, it's the most deceptive sense actually in wine tasting. So everybody looks at it. It's funny because you played that sideways clip and there, everybody's looking at their wine. What are you looking for? Well, the first thing you're looking for, is there anything dangerous or gross floating in there? I mean, who's going to drink? You need to get a filter if there's stuff floating in your wine. You don't want to drink that stuff. The wine should not have floaters in it. So if there's cork or like, you know, crystals, which are fine, there's like sometimes in Riesling, for instance, they don't do this process where they they like uh, freeze it down or put the put the wine almost to freezing and then it takes out the tartrates and that will make sure that there's no little like crystals at the bottom of it. Sometimes you'll pour a glass of Riesling or, or Gruner Veltliner from Austria and there'll be these little crystals. There's nothing wrong with it, but they're disgusting if you taste them. You don't want to taste tannin or sediment, all that sediment at the bottom, the little, you know, looks like Goldschlager, you know, from my, <laughs> my college days. <laughs> of, uh, but it's wine Goldschlager at the bottom of the you don't want to do that. So just get a filter, but you should be looking at your wine. Also transport is hard on wine. It's an agricultural product. that's made from chemical processes. Stuff can go wrong. So don't drink it. If it looks gross, that's the first thing. Color is secondary and darker colors usually mean that it's from a warmer climate in whites and reds. Um, and lighter colors mean that, that it's from a cooler climate. Hmm. Next is swirling, and I think a lot of us might feel a little self-conscious doing this in public because we feel like we're doing something that we don't quite understand, but we know we're supposed to. So what do we learn from swirling the wine around in the glass? Okay, again, totally practical thing. So let's pretend the wine is like this prisoner trapped inside of a bottle. It has no oxygen, barely any oxygen. It's just sitting there. It's kind of embalmed in there. Well, once you let the cork out of the bottle or take the screw cap off, which, by the way, great closure. Don't be afraid of screw cap. Um then you're letting in air. And what that does is, again, it's allowing a little bit of a chemical reaction to happen with the wine. And then the wine becomes its best self. So after being trapped inside that bottle, it just needs a little bit of air. And what swirling does is just increases the amount of airflow through the wine. So it becomes more alive and fresh. You always want to hold the glass by the stem because, you know, the I don't like stemless glasses. Your hands are hot. 
And so they're going to change the temperature of the wine. So those stems are really, really important. Plus, it makes swirling a lot easier. If you have a stemless glass, it's kind of awkward. <laughs> I also thought it was interesting that you said that for the wine to, to really have room to breathe literally and, and figuratively, that it's better to fill it at the most a half full in your glass. So even if we are thinking of having a fair amount of wine, maybe a few smaller glasses instead of one really big glass. Yeah. You know what the worst is? You go to a restaurant and they give you those giant filled up glasses. There's no room to swirl. And that is when you are going to get it all over yourself. So I always just ask them if I could have a second glass, even if they, you know, just to pour it in, if they're not busy and I'm not being annoying, whatever, because I, I, I used to be a server. So I totally understand what that's like. But you shouldn't pour. That's when you're going to get into the mess of the bad swirling. So it just you just fill it a little bit and get that air in. And there's always more. Don't worry. <laughs> and there is also something about kind of how I don't want to say thick, but how how the wine kind of clings or doesn't to the glass. Right. Yes. And I they're called tears or legs. It's actually it's actually a very interesting effect that was discovered by this Italian called Marangoni. And he did a, a paper. And I, said, I think there was a French guy who actually discovered it, but this guy really articulated it in a paper. And basically what it says is there's a surface area difference or a surface tension difference rather between water, which is what wine mostly is, right? Wine is mostly water. And then the alcohol and the sugars. So when you swirl on the glass, what's, what runs down first is the water. What's left on the sides are those alcohols or sugars. And it makes sense since alcohol is just fermented sugar. So then we've got, you know, that that's sort of how you can tell if a wine's really high alcohol. So that's a good indicator of what's about to hit you. If you, you know, that alcohol feeling almost feels like a shot it burns going down your throat. So those high alcohol wines, which people always say, oh, I'll get a headache from wine. Check your alcohol levels because if things are around the 14 percent mark, which a lot of California wines, especially are places from real sunny places, you're going to or wines from real sunny places. You're going to get that. And that will give you a headache, by the way, too. We're talking with Elizabeth Schneider right now. She's a certified sommelier and certified specialist of wine. Her new book is titled Wine for Normal People, a guide for real people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. And we want to hear from you at 800-642-1234. Are you intimidated by a wine list in a restaurant or by trying to pick out a bottle in a store? What part of how wine is talked about is the most confusing to you? And if you're looking for something you might like, let Elizabeth help. Give us a call at 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234 or post on the Ideas Network Facebook page. We'll pick up the conversation after this short break. Stay with us here on Central Time. You're listening to Central Time on the Ideas Network. I'm Judith Sears Poisson. Right now, we're picking up our talk with Elizabeth Schneider. She's a certified sommelier, certified specialist of wine, and the creator of the podcast, Wine for Normal People. Her new book is titled Wine for Normal People, a guide for real people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. And we want to hear from you at 800-642-1234. Do you feel like you know how to navigate the world of wine? Do you get intimidated by how wines are described? What about price? Are you unsure of how much you might need to spend to get a bottle that you'll enjoy? Call 800-642-1234. That's 800-642-1234 or email us at ideas at WPR.org. Now, Elizabeth, we've looked, we've swirled, and now we're going to sniff. And I love how you describe the kind of sniffing to do. It has to do with dogs. <laughs> it does have to do with dogs. You know, dogs are awesome sniffers. Do you, do you have a dog, Judah? I don't. But I, as soon as you said that, I thought of it. They do the little, the quick, rapid sniffing, not like a huge, I forget how you say, not like you're smelling your Thanksgiving turkey. Yes, right. Exactly. So so they actually have stereophonic noses. Can you tell how nerdy I am? I, <laughs> I go down these rabbit holes. It's just so bad. I can't, I can't stop myself. So they have four chambers in their noses, actually. So they can smell a lot more and distinguish so many more things. I would love to be a dog for a day just to be able to smell every wine in the world, actually. But anyway, beyond that, what happens is that when we sniff, if you do, if you do do that big anteater sniff where you're just sucking in the wine, it, the problem is you fatigue your nose. You know when you go to the perfume counter at Macy's or wherever, and and it just stinks. They're overwhelming you with <laughs> overwhelming all that. Overwhelming is a good way to put it. Yes. 
Yeah, well, that what happens to your nose is that your nose is now fatigued because you have these little sensors, these receptors, and they've gotten too much information and it's very hard for you to process that. So now all you smell is, you know, that one really stinky note and you can't smell anything else. You got to wait for a while for your, for things to calm down. So you don't want to do that with wine. Instead, you just want to take small little sniffs and after you've swirled the wine um, and, and it's got a little bit more going on. Now you can smell it. And that's when you just sort of think about what comes to mind. And the things that I try to say, your, your nose is now transmitting information to your brain and your brain is saying, what is that? what is that? Oh my gosh, what is that? So in the book, I always lay out and I teach online classes also. And one of the things I always do is give a vocabulary sheet out because I feel like it's on the tip of your brain. You're sitting there going, wait, is that flowers? What does that smell? It smells like something I know. That experience is so frustrating. And then it doesn't help that people are like, well, it's like grabbing steamed apples and whatever that guy said, whatever Miles said in, in Sideways. Or they're like, it smells like uh, whatever. I mean, and you're like, I don't even know what that is. I don't know what that is. Maybe to you, it smells like lemons or to me, it smells like limes or citrus, whatever. So I just say, Try your best to figure out what category is category it falls into because sometimes things smell like fruit. A lot of times wine doesn't even smell like fruit, especially from Europe. So it's important sort of to character characterize it and to do it with some confidence and with some guide. Like have a have that vocabulary sheet around. It really helps a lot. Let's go to the phones at 800 642 1234 And Douglas is up in Chicago. Hi, Douglas. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Hey, Douglas. Douglas is a longtime podcast listener. Well, there you go. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. I'm wondering what you've been pouring during these eight nights. And also, um, if you have any any advice for like defensive buying before the tariffs take over, if you think they're going to take over. Thanks for those questions, Elizabeth. So uh, what have I been pouring? I've been pouring a little bit of everything, but champagne has definitely actually been on my table. I am Jewish, so latkes and champagne are really fantastic. I also had a delicious gracchetto from Umbria, which is the, the Italian wines tend to be really, they can be crisp, but also have this kind of like softness to them, which is really, really nice with fried foods and things like that. And I had a lasagna last night, so we had some Italian wine with that. Um, in terms of the tariffs, now just to quickly explain what's going on there, um, unfortunately, there's a, a dispute over over aircraft with Airbus, and as a result, the administration in the U.S. is is uh, thinking about putting a hundred percent tariff on all European wines. That is going to be pretty crippling to the industry here because we think of the wine industry as being California and Washington and all the producers, but there's a whole bunch of people who also make their money selling wine from abroad and importing it. And so that's going to be quite difficult. So defensive buying, I mean, I would say we just have to keep watching to see whether or not there's already a 25% tariff on French wine, but we'll have to see if that goes, if when when that's going to go into effect. And before I would say we should probably think about buying a few cases of your favorite wines because it's going to be a little bit of a bumpy ride before that, that stops. We're talking with Elizabeth Schneider right now. She is the author of Wine for Normal People, a guide for real people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. And Elizabeth, I want to get back to our little um, progression there. So uh, we, we've we looked at it, we've swirled it, we've sniffed it. Finally, we're ready to actually taste it. <laughs> what do we add to the profile when we actually take a sip of that wine? Judith, I love that you just said that, that you said, like, what do we add to the profile? Because I think the, actually your nose is one of the most important or is the most important thing. All you're doing when you're tasting, taste is a really funny thing because it's a little deceptive. It's also smell. You're getting closer to those smell receptors. So you have a whole other experience of it being right up close and personal, but then you also have texture. So you have, is it acidic underneath your tongue is watering? That usually means it's going to go pretty well with food. Is it tannic, which is that mouth drying, mouth puckering, like dry, you're in the desert and haven't had water for five years. And then there's, a, you know, there's other things. Is it alcoholic? We talked about that burn. So as you put the wine in your mouth, you, it sometimes helps to hold it there for a second. That way you're giving your smell receptors a little bit more time to pick up information. And then when you swallow the wine, then you get a kind of impression of what it is. Do you, did you, did, you know, what is it? Is it, is, is it making your tongue water? Is that something you like or don't like? Is it, uh, 
Is that mouth drying sensation something you like or don't like? Would it be better with food? Lots of times wine is better with food. So you taste it out of turn. You have these wine tastings where no food is involved. And really some wines are made to go with food. I would say pretty much the entire portfolio of Italian wine should be consumed with food. So having it alone is not going to show it best. So, Elizabeth, what do we do with all that information? We might learn that we like or don't like a particular bottle. How do we use that information then to know what we might want to try next? It's so great to be able to actually articulate or think about the things that you liked about the wine and don't like about the wine. And this is where that vocabulary as annoying as it is, comes into play. Because all you're doing is now you're going to take this set of things that you know you like, and sometimes it's more helpful to say the things you do not like, and then bring them to the mountain, which is the sometimes snotty person at the wine store or sometimes really nice person at the wine store. But if the more that you can speak their language and get on that page, they will be able to direct you to all sorts of things that you didn't even know existed. So I think the really important thing is to try to get some of that lexicon and vocabulary. And that's why in the book, a lot of books take that vocabulary and shove it in the back. I spend three chapters on <laughs> vocabulary in various different forms because if you don't get that down, it's going to be so difficult to communicate. The point of communicating is not so you can write your own tasting notes and wax poetic about wine and blah, blah, blah. It's just so you can get really great stuff from people who speak that language. So, Elizabeth, I'm hoping that that some people who are listening are feeling a little more confident, like, you know, maybe they can uh, do some tasting and maybe go uh, and you know try out some different wines for people who might be just getting started with trying to develop, you know, that sense of smell and that sense of taste and how to describe it, paying a little more attention to what they're drinking. Are there some good varieties to start with? It depends on whether you like red or white. But the thing that I like to do is is find things that are very crisp and very clear. So as you get into the wine world, things become more complex. And so I think things like Riesling, a germ, a nice German Riesling, whether you like sweet or dry, the flavors generally tend to be very clear, something from the Mosel Valley, M-O-S-E-L, or something from an area called Faltz, if you like dry wines, P-F-A-L-Z. Those have really clear flavors. If you like Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, very clear flavors, easy to describe, easy to pinpoint, easy to say, oh, that tastes like grapefruit. You know, so so that's that's very good. Gewürztraminer is another one from uh, the Alsace region of France, which is very, it's got very clear notes. Um, so I think, and then if you like reds, I would even say something like a Beaujolais is great. Clear flavors. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Elizabeth Schneider is a certified sommelier and the creator of the podcast Wine for Normal People. That is also the title of her new book. 